Good morning. Um, thank you for joining us for our Worship Grand Rounds this morning. If you are an Emory University or healthcare employee and you would like to receive a CME credit hour for attending today's lecture, uh, the login information can be found in the chat feature right at the bottom of your screen. If you have any issues with this webinar or the CME login, uh, please send Kadir to Fofana an email or drop a note via the chat feature. Uh, this morning, we are really pleased and excited to welcome Dr. Adetunji Toriola. Dr. Toriola received his MD from the Obafemi University in Obafemi Awolowo University, Ilefe, Nigeria in 1998. Uh, he earned his MPH at the University of Kopio in Finland in 2007, uh, followed by his PhD in epidemi ep epidemiology at the University of Tampere, Finland. He subsequently completed his postdoctoral fellowship in 2012 at the German Cancer Research Center in Alderberg, Germany. Dr. Toriola is a professor of surgery and the William H. Danforth uh, Washington University Physician Scholar. He leads the Cancer Prevention and Control Program at the Seitman Cancer Center, and his research focuses on characterizing the molecular basis and determinants of mammographic breast density and breast cancer in order to identify those that can be targeted in breast cancer prevention, especially in premenopausal women. He is the principal investigator on two R01s in this research area, including an NCI Merit Award. He uh, is currently leading a phase two clinical trial investigating the impact of the rank L inhibition in mammographic breast density and breast tissue blood markers in premenopausal women with dense breast. He's also applying state-of-the-art omics platforms to interrogate the metabolite uh, profiles of mammographic breast density in premenopausal women. In addition, it performs molecular epidemiologic studies on colorectal and pancreatic cancers evaluating the utility of biomarkers to investigate the associations of energetics and inflammation with risk and mortality. He is the uh, multi-PI on the Col ColoCare study, a large multi-center cohort of colorectal cancer patients for interdisciplinary studies of colorectal cancer prognosis and outcomes. Over the years, he has received numerous honors and awards, including the Susan G. Komen Career Catalyst Award uh, in the basic and translational space. That was from 2015 to 2019. And the Postal Prize Award from the European Society for Biomedical Research on Alcoholism Symposium, Edinburgh, Germany in 2010. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Toriola. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Aleshe, for um, inviting me to give this talk and for the kind introduction. So um, welcome, everyone. My talk this morning is titled Cancer Prevention from Discovery to Clinical Translation. I understand that um, the audience may be mainly physicians, but I'd like to take us back to what we can do as physicians and physician sciences to start um, taking back the clock of cancer to how we can prevent it before um, it actually develops and how we can reduce the burden and incidence of cancer um, in, in, in the United States. So one of the things um, that I would like to take us back to is that genomic studies have consistently shown that um, cancer for us to have an impact on cancer we need to go back to as far back as possible because studies in pancreatic cancer have shown that the timeline from the first cellular damage or first cellular changes to initiation of the tumor clone can take about eight to 14 years. And from the clone to subclones with metastatic potential can take another um, three to 10 years. 
Overall, um, it takes about 13 to 25 years for pancreatic cancer initiation to metastasis. So it is within this developmental timeline that we have to identify the most optimal part of the process to intercept in cancer prevention and to use robust and well-validated phenotypes of in or intermediate endpoints to evaluate whether our interception is likely to be successful or not. Cancer prevention research can appear non-rewarding because it takes decades of work to notice the impact at the individual level and at the population level. And some of the challenges that we currently face um, in terms of cancer prevention are the fact that um, cancer prevention research can sometimes take a short focus approach and um, trying to get um, the most optimal benefits within a very short time, even though we know that the timeline to, from um, tumor initiation to progression takes several years. Also, based on the knowledge that we're beginning to accumulate, we be, we're beginning to understand that some of the interventions or some of the processes start very early in life, and we have not been able to initiate cancer prevention activities or efforts that start very early in life. So that's a limitation and weakness that we have to begin to work on. Also, transdisciplinary approach in relation to cancer prevention, I've only recently been encouraged. And it's this transdisciplinary approaches that have led to my, um, significant breakthroughs in cancer prevention research. And lastly, um, difficulties with cancer, implementing cancer prevention. We understand that um, to have an impact on cancer prevention, it could take years where you see nothing really happening and then um, something happens in the long term. So it's, it can be very challenging to initiate a sustained um, cancer prevention activities. So um, for this talk, I would focus on, oops. Okay, um, the overview of my talk this morning, I'll focus on the applications of these things, what we have learned in relation to breast cancer prevention, which is one of my focus areas, as Dr. Alish has mentioned, in addition to colorectal and um, pancreatic cancer. But for this talk, I'm gonna focus on what we've done in relation to breast cancer prevention, how we've been able to apply observational um, studies, population-based studies, taking it to phase one clinical studies and eventually phase two clinical studies on prevention. And my talk is gonna focus on our work on um, the re uh, receptor activator nuclear factor um, beta ligand signaling in breast cancer and um, prevention in premenopausal women. Um, as we all know, breast cancer accounts for one in four cancers in women, and worldwide, um, about 2.3 million new breast cancer cases were diagnosed in 2020. What is not really well known is that um, almost 25% um, of the new cases of breast cancers that are diagnosed are diagnosed in premenopausal women. So that means, for instance, last year, um, in 2021, about 500,000 new cases of premenopausal breast cancer were diagnosed. What makes premenopausal breast cancer more challenging is that um, premenopausal breast cancer is diagnosed at more advanced stages than postmenopausal breast cancer, and it has less favorable prognosis. The, one of the main reasons for this is because um, screening and prevention and um, screening efforts usually start at later stages when a lot of women would have um, been picked up to have um, premenopausal breast cancer already. Except in high risk women, screening starts around age 50. So that is one of the reasons why um, it's really, really crucial to go back in time to see how we can do or what we can do to start um, preventing premenopausal breast cancer. In this study led by one of um, a, 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 a talented PhD student that used to be in my, in my lab, we observed that um, there have been increases in premenopausal breast cancer by both birth and calendar cohort. And what we can see is that breast cancer incidence was 17% higher among women born in the late 80s and 22% higher among women born in the 90s compared to women born um, in back in the 1940s. Um, this is an effect of the birth, um, birth cohort in terms of relation to breast cancer incident in premenopausal women. The other thing we, I would like to point out is that the increasing incidence in premenopausal women 
uh, breast cancer in premenopausal women is irregardless of race. It affects um, all racial groups in the United States. Um, the, the rate of increase has been much faster in some racial groups than others, but every, um, every racial group um, has, has an increase in incidence rates. Perhaps one of the most peculiar things that we have observed is that while the rates of e um, estrogen receptor positive cancers have been increasing in premenopausal women over the years, the rates of estrogen receptor negative cancers have actually been going down. So um, there's something that is actually happening that we can begin to learn from and apply to estrogen receptor positive breast cancers, which accounts for more than 80% of breast cancer cases um, diagnosed in the United States, especially in premenopausal women. So one of the things of framework that I've begun to look at this is um, what are the opportunities we have to reduce premenopausal breast cancer? And um, one of the things that I've come to is that we need to address the risk factors that drive the increase in ER positive tumors and also learn um, a lot from what has led to the decrease in ER negative tumors. Um, I've done some work, well, my, lab, my lab has done some work in that space, but that's not going to be the focus of my presentation um, today. Um, the focus of my presentation today is going to be on identifying novel pathways that can be targeted in breast cancer prevention. And if we do identify novel um, pathways, we can then identify or design um, chemo prevention options for high-risk women in order to reduce their risk of developing um, premenopausal breast cancer. And this is just an overview of a um, study done by um, Ankinson et al. Um, and they show that you can see that here, um, there are different um, subtypes of breast cancers have different um, risk factors. And it's important for us to have a targeted approach identifying the risk factors for each um, particular subtype of breast cancer and designing targets specifically for, those, um, for that particular type of breast cancer. So um, my work has focused on understanding the determinants on the genomic characteristics of mammographic density. And why mammographic density? Mammographic breast density reflects the amount of epithelial and stromal tissues in the breast in relation to the adipose tissue components. A mammographic density, especially a high mammographic density on mammogram is one of the strongest risk factors for breast cancers. And in this figure here, what you can see is that dense breast tissue appears light or lucent on radiographs of breast images, and by contrast, fat appears dark. What has been consistently shown is that women with dense breast, um, that is, a woman with um, dense breast, um, as denoted by the figure in F, they have a four to six fold increased risk of breast cancer compared to women with um, entirely fatty breast or lower dense breast, such as women within um, categories A and B. Also, if you can see from this figure, these are the modifiable risk factors for breast cancer. And as you can see, of all the modifiable risk factors that confer a relative risk greater than four on breast cancer, Mammographic density appears to be the only, I mean, of all the risk factors, mammographic density appears to be the only one that is potentially modifiable. The other figure on the right also shows us the um, main determinants or risk factors for breast cancer and, um, and also some of their um, relative risk. And you can see um, having DCIs and LCIs, which we haven't been able to figure out how best to address or tackle are some of the strongest risk factors for breast cancer, followed by a um, higher breast density. But we, one thing we need to keep in mind is that um, risk factors um, and their relative risk in terms of breast cancer and also the population attributable risk factors all depend on the prevalence of the risk factors and the relative risk of that risk factor in relation to the outcome of interest. And these figures here show the risk factors for breast cancer, the population frequency, and the potential reduction in breast cancer that you could achieve by targeting some of these risk factors. Um, if you can see um, on the left, uh, um, and with very high risk are the genetic um, mutations, which we are all very familiar with, BRCA mutations, um, P10 mutations, and the rare and uh, moderate risk alleles, um, CHECK2 mutations and PALP B2 mutations are also 
confer, also confer very high risk, but their population frequency is very, very low. If you can see here, um, having moderate or high density is much more prevalent in, 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 this, in the population, and the relative risk is very, very high. So as a result, you can see that the population attributable risk of breast cancer from having dense breasts is very high, especially in premenopausal women. So what these figures or numbers show is that 28% um, of breast cancers in premenopausal women can potentially be prevented if we reduce a woman's density from high dense breast or extremely dense breast to areas of scat scat um, scattered areas of fibroglandular tissue or, uh, of entirely fatty breast. If you compare that to um, um, the population attributable risk due to having a family history of breast cancer, which is 8.7, you can see that we have greater opportunities for cancer, breast cancer prevention if we target um, women with, who have um, high, dense, high breast density. The other important thing to know is that in addition to being a very strong risk factor for breast cancer, mammographic density and breast cancer share similar biological and genetic pathways. In these studies, what the authors did was they constructed risk scores using genetic variants most strongly associated with mammographic breast density. And what they found out was that women in the top 10 percentile of the risk score distribution had a 31% increased risk of breast cancer compared to women in the low 10 percentile. And other studies after that has also shown that um, mammographic density um, also shares very strong biological pathways um, with breast cancer. So there is a very strong rationale for targeting mammographic breast density in breast cancer prevention because one, it is a very strong risk factor for breast cancer. Two, it is an intermediate um, phenotype for breast cancer and she has very strong biological and genetic pathways with breast cancer development. Studies have also shown that a reduction in breast um, density over time leads to a reduction in breast cancers. These are observational studies. Um, this is a meta-analysis that was published just last year showing you that if you reduce a woman's um, mammographic breast density over time, um, you also um, substantially reduce the risk of developing breast cancer. Here, the authors looked at both um, case control studies and cohort studies, and they found that, that in cohort studies, which, which are prospective um, studies, if you reduce a woman's mammographic breast density from extremely dense breast to um, lower dense less density values, you can actually achieve a 22% reduction in breast cancer risk. Um, when they also looked at case control studies, there was also a 10% reduction in breast cancer risk, but um, the greater weight of evidence goes with um, prospective cohort studies. Effective primary prevention requires an understanding of the biologic processes underlying carcinogenesis, the availability of biomarkers to identify high-risk individuals and interventions that effectively decrease risk with minimal side effects. However, the biologic basis of mammographic breast density is poorly understood and viable strategies to reduce breast density associated breast cancer have not yet been fully developed. Um, diet and lifestyle are not strongly related to mammographic density in adult populations and dietary, and lifestyle modifications are not likely to impact mammographic breast density. We have done a lot of work in my team to show the determinants of mammographic density. One of the first things we found was that 26% of the variation in mammographic density can be attributable to differences in body mass index, and some of the other variations can be attributable to age and reproductive factors. We recently just showed in, a, in an article published in JAMA Network Open that women who have a family history of breast cancer in a first degree relative have a significantly elevated mammographic density, which also confers an elevated risk of breast cancer on this women. So of course we know that we cannot really intervene in a woman's um, family history those are genetic determinants that cannot be intervened upon. But there are lifestyle factors that we're beginning to see how they 
impact um, the biology and genomic milieu and see whether we can begin to intervene upon this. One thing I'd like to emphasize here is that we know that population-based preventive programs such as avoiding alcohol, reducing obesity and um, diet, dietary modifications, they are very effective in preventing breast cancer. But studies have also consistent, consistently shown that adopting a sustained healthier lifestyle for chronic disease prevention is very challenging. And this is perhaps one of the reasons why um, it takes many years and it can be very challenging to adopt a sustained healthy lifestyle factor um, for breast cancer prevention. For instance, um, seminar work done by Dr. Kolditz and Kathy Barkey has shown that um, if you avoid, we know that alcohol intake increases the risk of breast cancer. If you avoid alcohol intake, for somebody who's been taking alcohol before and then avoid alcohol intake, it takes about 10 to 20 years for you to see a benefit on breast cancer reduction. Um, maintaining healthy weight and avoiding weight gain also reduces the risk of breast cancer, but it takes about 10 to 30 years for you to see the benefit of that uh, maintaining that healthy weight lifestyle. Physical activity, the same thing. It takes um, physical activity 30 days a week for five days, um, 30, 30 minutes a day for five days a week has also been shown to consistently reduce the risk of breast cancer. But once again, it takes about 10 to 30 years for you to see the benefit of that effect. Dietary factors, the same thing. But if you look further down, more drastic measures that involve um, interventions, especially pharmacological or surgical intervention, tends to be much more um, have much more in immediate effect. Tamoxifen is um, a chemo prevention that has been used um, that has been studied extensively and has been shown to reduce the risk of breast cancer. Um, tamoxifen for chemo prevention actually kicks in, and the time to benefit for breast cancer prevention is about two years. The same for prophylactic bilateral ophorectomy as well. You begin to see a time to benefit um, in about two years. Um, therefore, identifying pathways that can be targeted to reduce breast density and breast cancer incidence is an unmet need, especially in premenopausal women. We recently just um, published a, meta um, a systemic review looking at um, chemo prevention um, options that are available for premenopausal women in order to reduce their risk of breast cancer. The currently six chemo prevention options have been approved for chemo prevention in postmenopausal women, but only one has been approved for chemo prevention in premenopausal women so far. So there is definitely a need to identify new chemo prevention options for premenopausal women in order to reduce their risk of breast cancer. And this is um, a summary of our findings for our systematic review published in GNCI Cancer Spectrum last year. Um, a lot of the studies, we identified seven studies that have, um, that have um, been published in this space. Most of the studies um, did not adjust for BMI and age, which we have determined and others have also determined to be the major drivers of mammographic breast density. Um, the studies, only tamoxifen has been shown to have a clinically significant reduction in mammographic breast density. Um, work done by Jack Cusick in, um, using the IB, in the IBIS trial is, has shown that reducing breast density is associated with a reduced risk of breast cancer. But for you to have a reduction in breast cancer risk by reducing breast density, a woman must have a 10% reduction in mammographic density for her to benefit from um, tamoxifen chemo prevention. In this study, what um, the IBIS trial showed that um, women who are assigned to tamoxifen and others who are assigned to um, placebo, um, over a period of um, 12 to 18 months, there was a mean reduction in the mammographic breast density among women assigned to the placebo compared to women assigned to the, I mean, a mean reduction in mammographic density of about 7.9% in the tamoxifen group compared to 3.5% in the placebo group. These differences were still sustained at around um, six years, about 13.7% in the tamoxifen group and about 7% in the placebo group. 
one of the most um, intriguing and important findings from this study is that women in the tamoxifen harm who experience a greater than 10% reduction in their mammographic density at the 12 month time point, at the 63% reduction in breast cancer risk at six months, I mean, at, at six years. But women who were assigned to tamoxifen but did not had a reduction in mammographic density that did not get to the 10% mark, did not experience a reduction in breast cancer risk. So as a result, tamoxifen has been approved for chemo prevention of breast cancer in pre and postmenopausal women. Unfortunately, the attendant side effects of tamoxifen limits is widespread use in chemo for chemo prevention in premenopausal women, out flushes, potential risk of endometrial cancer, and tipping women to postmenopausal status. As a result, just less than 0.3% of eligible women use tamoxifen for chemo prevention. So um, I strongly believe that we need to identify new targetable pathways that can reduce mammographic density, that have fewer side effects, and they are much more broadly applicable to many women, especially um, premenopausal women. This has led um, others to look at the role of other potential um, hormonal agents that could um, potentially be targeted. And one agent has been um, estrogen and progesterone um, um, combination. Studies have consistently shown that women will use um, estrogen and progesterone um, for um, for after menopause have a, an increase in mammographic density. That's been shown in the Women's Health Initiative um, trial. And also these women, um, women who use estrogen plus progesterone um, for HRT, hormone replacement therapy, menopausal hormone therapy use, they also, also have an increase in um, breast cancer risk as well. And it is thought that the increase in breast cancer risk is mediated by um, the effect of the estrogen plus progesterone use on mammographic density. Over the last few years, um, studies have shown that um, the rank ligand signaling is a downstream mediator of progesterone um, activity. It's been shown that rank ligand signaling is essential for development of lobular alveolar mammary gland structures and formation of lactating mammary gland. Rank ligand signaling also mediates the major proliferative response of the mammary epithelium to progesterone, and it also mediates the progestin-driven expansion of mammary stem cells. Preclinical studies have shown that when you disrupt um, rank ligand signaling, you can actually attenuate progestin-driven mammary epithelial cell proliferation, and you can reduce the onset of mammary tumors in preclinical models. In addition to being a, um, in addition to um, being affecting downstream mediators um, related to um, progesterone signaling, rank ligand signaling also affects other um, downstream pathways that could be related to mammary carcinogenesis. So for me, this makes the rank ligand signaling a very, very interesting and intriguing target um, when it comes to identifying novel targetable pathways that we can target in reducing mammographic density and reducing the risk of breast cancer. What even makes um, the rank ligand signaling and pathway exciting to target is that a well-tolerated rank ligand antibody, um, denalcimab, is already in clinical use for preventing osteoporosis in, in postmenopausal women. Um, one of the challenges of oxifen for chemo prevention is that women have to take it every day for them to have a benefit. And that's, um, but the good thing about um, the rank ligand inhibitor that is currently in clinical use is that it is administered once every six months and it has a therapeutic effect um, when it's administered once every six months. It has a very long half-life. It's been shown to be very effective with this, uh, with this administration. Um, like I mentioned, um, it's been shown that inhibition of rank ligand signaling decreased um, tumor formation in experimental models. Um, my lab over the last um, eight or 10 years has focused a lot on trying to identify um, or determine the role of rank ligand signaling in 
premenopausal women in mammographic breast density in premenopausal women. And this are some of the work that we have done in that space. We have looked at um, the associations of breast tissue, Rankleigen gene expression, and mammographic breast density. Um, we have looked at the role of circulating rank biomarkers and mammographic density. We have also looked at the role of plasma rank ligand gene expression and mammographic density. Um, we have taken some of the findings from these observational studies further to design a phase one clinical trial looking at whether the impact of inhibiting rank ligand signaling on breast tissue markers. And currently we are um, performing a phase two randomized clinical trial looking at the impact of rank ligand inhibition on mammographic breast density in premenopausal women. I will, over the next few slides, go over some of our findings and, and give you a summary of where we are in this research space. And the first study we um, performed in this space was published in 2017. And in this space, this all, what we did was identify um, premenopausal women um, who had provided breast tissues um, to the St. Louis Breast Tissue Registry as part of routine clinical care. We then identified um, 48 women we then, and used nanostring gene expression profile to profile their um, breast tissue gene expression. We performed very targeted gene expression for markers in the rank pathway and also um, insulin growth factor and hormone pathways as well. And what this, what we found was that women who had higher rank ligand gene expression within their breast tissues had higher mammographic breast density. And this was very exciting to us. Um, and the next thing we did was that, well, this is a retrospective study using already collected data what would happen if we um, take this and design a prospective study where instead of using um, retrospective collected data, we actually collect um, data prospectively from these women. So I designed a study looking at um, recruiting 365 premenopausal women who came in for regular annual screening mammogram. On the day of their mammogram, we collected blood samples from these women and we also collected questionnaire-related information on several risk factors that are potentially associated with um, breast cancer risk and mammographic density. Um, this was published in Cancer Prevention Research in 2018, and the study was highlighted in the October edition of Cancer Prevention Research as um, a very important finding in the field. So what we did here was that, first of all, we looked at the role of circulating um, rank and also soluble rank ligand in relation to volumetric percent density and dense volume. And what we found out was that women who have higher um, circulating rank ligand within their circulation had higher um, volumetric percent density, which is a quantitative way of determining mammographic density that, that we use for this study. It's much easier to use than um, the BIRAT's clinical measurement. And many clinical um, radiology breast health units are now using these um, quantitative measures to determine mammographic density for many women. So we also found out that um, having higher rank ligand, um, solid, um, uh, um, uh, circulating rank ligand was associated with increased um, dense volume as well. However, we did not find an association in the overall analysis between soluble rank ligand concentrations and volumetric percent density and also dense volume. Based on our knowledge and understanding of the um, effect or activity of um, soluble rank ligand being a downstream mediator of progesterone signaling, we then um, performed additional analysis, um, sensitivity analysis, um, looking at the impact of soluble rank ligand signaling on mammographic density by um, concentrations of progesterone, because um, we know that um, soluble rank ligand signaling is a downstream mediator of progesterone um, action within the breast and within the body. And what this showed us was that among women with low 
circulating progesterone level, there was no association between soluble rank ligen and volumetric percent density. But among women with higher progesterone levels, you can see a linear increase in mammographic density by soluble rank ligand concentrations. Similar findings were evident for um, circulating rank ligand as well. This, we were very excited to notice this. And so we then designed, um, took this further, designed a phase one clinical study to see whether if you intervene, um, if you inhibit rank ligand concentrations within the breast, what with um, denosumab, what are the downstream markers that you're going to potentially impact? So this is a study we recruited um, 10 premenopausal women into this pilot study. The women at the time of, um, at the time we saw them, we um, gave them a rank ligand inhibitor, denosumab. Um, all these were premenopausal women. We um, also, before we gave them the denosumab intervention, we collected um, their breast tissue from the most dense part of the breast. We also collected a blood sample as well. And then what we did was we then asked the women to return back in two months during the same phase of the menstrual cycle. And we, and we repeated the breast tissue biopsy and also we repeated the blood draw as well. And what you can see here is that um, Rankligan inhibition was associated with down regulation of both um, breast tissue markers. You can see a lot of um, genes were upregulated and a lot of genes were also downregulated and also several genes um, were not um, impacted at all. One of the things in, in the initial analysis, one of the things we found was um, one of the genes that was most strongly upregulated was UDP glucuronin transferred family B15, which plays a very important role in the um, regulation of um, steroid hormones in the body. We also looked at um, the impact of rank ligand inhibition on gene expression within the blood as well. And as you can see, there, um, there were also some genes that were upregulated and downregulated in the blood, but some of the uh, most prominent ones were related to um, immune signaling and inflammatory signaling. I have more data on that, which I'll show from some of the additional analysis that we performed. This is just a schematic overview of the phase one clinical trial that I've described. And one of the things we're also interested in the overlap between um, gene expression changes within the breast and gene expression changes within the blood tissue. Um, unfortunately, while we found that several genes were upregulated within the blood and within the breast tissues, there was very minimal overlap in terms of and the concordance in the um, genes that were upregulated in the blood and in the breast, and also genes that were regulated, downregulated within the breast and the blood as well. Um, one of the um, very talented um, residents um, in, in, that I, has been working with me has been going, taking a deep dive into some of the findings that we um, observed in this um, preclinical phase one study. And some of the pathways that were most downregulated by rank ligand inhibition within the breast tissues were related to neutrophil activation, neutrophil degranulations, you know, things related to cellular defense response. We also found um, pathways that were related to steroid hormone metabolism and also um, fatty acid um, derivative biosynthesis signaling that were um, upregulated within um, the breast tissues. We've also been applying um, um, CompBio, which is a comprehensive multiomics platform to understand the biological underpinnings of some of the findings that we observed in this phase one um, clinical trial. This would help us to provide an holistic contextual map of the core biological concepts and also themes of pathways that work together that rank ligand inhibition can have an impact on. And we've been able to identify um, themes that are beginning to emerge and which are themes regulated to um, cell stress signaling, um, NRF inhibition, and also 
themes related to other um, immunoglobulin and also inflammatory and lymphocyte signaling as well. Um, work on this is still ongoing. It's, um, it's a very complex um, bioinformatic undertaking. And we want to be sure that we get everything right. We're beginning to apply single cell um, technologies to give us a better understanding of what is really going on at the cellular level and begin to tease out um, things that we can begin to target further up in future. Based on some of this um, observational findings and some of the findings from um, the phase one clinical trial, um, we have started a phase two clinical trial, which is called the Trident trial, to determine the impact of ranclygan inhibition on breast mammographic breast density um, in iris premenopausal women. And this study started about three years ago, funded by an NCI R01. And for women to be eligible to be a part of this study, they need to be premenopausal, older than 40 years. They need to have dense breast on mammogram. And also they usually at an increased risk of breast cancer using some of the um, breast cancer risk prediction modeling. Um, um, Rosna called this model. Um, we recruit these women who come in for annual screening mammogram at the Breast Health Center at Sideman Cancer Center. The exclusion criteria for this phase two chemoprevention trial um, includes things that we know could be related to or increase the risk of adverse events on, on people, women who are given um, ranclygan antibodies. So women who are currently um, who have a history of invasive dental procedures because osteonecrosis of the jaw is one of the main side effects of denosumab. So we want to, in, we want to as much as possible, um, limit women um, having this side effects while on the trial. So these women are excluded from the trial. We're also excluding women who are currently taking other chemo prevention agents such as tamoxifen or participating in other chemo prevention agents as well as pregnant women. The goal of this phase two clinical trial is to randomize 210 healthy premenopausal women with dent breasts to an intervention of um, uh, 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 to an intervention arm or to a placebo arm. The intervention arm would have two doses of subcutaneous denosumab, 60 milligram at baseline and at six months, and the um, placebo arm would have 60. Um, we'll have two doses of subcutaneous um, placebo um, at baseline and at six months as well. The placebo um, portion was formulated at a pharmacy unit, and it's, um, very, it's very identical to the denosumab injection, so that there's no way to know um, which is what. Our procedures in this phase two clinical trial are to determine mammographic breast density at baseline at 12 months and at 24 months in both the intervention arm and also the placebo arm periposur. A primary outcome in this clinical trial is a change in mammographic breast density at 12 months. So the goal is to compare whether women who are assigned to the um, intervention arm have a greater reduction in mammographic density at 12 months compared to women who are assigned to the placebo arm. We would also do analysis looking at the effect of the intervention on breast tissue and markers, gene expression, blood tissue gene expression. And if we do find an association of the intervention on the primary endpoint, we're gonna be doing um, analysis, determining um, predictors of response to the nosumab so that we can um, give the intervention to women who are most likely to benefit. By the time, as of the time this study was designed um, three, four years ago, and of course, there have been major changes or major advances in omics technology, and we are hoping to take advantages of those omic technologies going forward um, as we um, go through the phase, um, this clinical trial. Um, this is just, I'm just, I'm going to spend the rest of the presentation describing what we have done so far in the clinical trial. So um, before women are put on the trial, we take them through a battery or screening test um, to be sure that they're not pregnant and also to ensure that their metabolic profile um, is um, safe enough for them to, um, to go undergo the trial. Um, 
this study started in August 2019, and we all know what happened um, almost immediately after. So we took us quite a few months to get IRB approval, but um, based on our experience with the phase one clinical trial, IRB um, was able to um, fast track our IRB application process. Um, so that's one really good thing I've learned from pilot studies. To get IRB for the pilot studies, it took us about six months, but it took us about three months to get our IRB for this phase two clinical trial because we had learned a lot from the first, from setting up the phase one pilot clinical trial, and we were able to tra transfer that knowledge into ensuring that we um, get a quicker IRB approval in this instance. And like I was mentioning, well, we started enrollment in August. The study started in August 2019. We put in place things, but unfortunately, um, that was when um, not too long after that COVID started. So our goal as of if everything was going as it should be, we had hoped that by this time, uh, we would have enrolled 170 um, premenopausal women into the trial. The study team has been actively working on this. Despite all the challenges, we've been able to consent 151 women on the trial. And so far, we've been able to fully enroll 113 women on the clinical trial. Um, currently, this is just an overview of the studies on the clinical trial. Um, about 110 women are currently on the clinical trial. Um, four women have withdrawn, and we've lost um, three women to follow up which is really um, much smaller than we would expect, given that um, this is a chemo prevention trial in women who do not have cancer. Our attrition rate at the beginning, when we designed the study, we had designed an attrition rate of 10%. So we're still very much within and below that attrition rate that we had anticipated. And um, one of um, the things I'm passionate about is to ensure an adequate representation um, in clinical research studies of all races. And we have been able to have um, targeted interventions focusing on um, African-Americans um, in the St. Louis area as well. So 75% of our study participants are currently non-Hispanic white and 25% are underrepresented in medicine. And of this, 19% um, of the total study population are non-Hispanic black women. This is an overview of what um, our visit completion summary is. We've been able to um, enroll 119 women onto the study and 118 of those women have completed baseline mammogram. Um, 114 women of the 119 have completed baseline blood draw. We've been able to complete baseline biopsy on 113 of these women. Um, of the 96 women who have got into the six month time point. We've done, um, given the six month intervention um, on 94 women. And of the 75 women who, are, who have reached the 70, the 12 month time point, we've been able to complete 12 month mammogram in 71 of them. Also of the 71 women who are eligible for the 12 month visit, which is repeat biopsy and blood draw, we've been able to complete the repeat biopsy and blood draw on 68 of these women. And of course, this will not be, this will have been impossible without the wonderful work uh, being done by this um, research, um, my members of my research team. And just to cut a long story short, um, there's an urgent need to translate breast cancer research for population benefit. This requires a population-based approach of reducing exposure to modifiable risk factors, and more specifically, uh, what I have been working on, a precision prevention approach of identifying women at increased risk and targeting them for specific interventions. We also know that 25% of breast cancer cases are diagnosed in premenopausal women, but lifestyle-related factors to reduce risk of breast cancer and chemo prevention options in premenopausal women are very limited. Studies have also shown that 29% of breast cancer cases in premenopausal women are attributable to dense breast, yet we have limited knowledge on how to reduce uh, breast cancer development in women with dense breast. 
Um, studies in my lab has shown that breast tissue rank gene expression, rank ligand gene expression is positively associated with mammographic density. And we've also shown association of circulating rank ligand biomarkers with mammographic breast density. We've completed a phase one clinical trial um, that show that there's rank ligand inhibition regulates signaling pathways that may be essential for proliferation and immune regulation. There's a phase one, a phase two clinical trial ongoing, which if successful, um, and it demonstrates that rank ligand inhibition reduces mammographic density, it could open up additional approaches to primary breast cancer prevention in premenopausal women with dense breasts. Importantly, our findings can be rapidly translated since denosumab is already approved for use in women without cancer. And one of the things that I've seen that has been very helpful here is that it's very essential to adopt a transdisciplinary approach to um, ensure speedy um, translation of um, population health um, benefits for breast cancer prevention. I'd like to leave us with this quote by Luis Pasteur, who says, to him who devotes his life to science, nothing can give more happiness than increasing the number of discoveries. But his cup of joy is full when the results of his studies immediately find practical application. So I'm hoping that some of the studies that we have done in this space would actually have practical implications in reducing um, the number of um, breast cancer cases um, that we see in premenopausal women from more than 500,000 per year to much lower than that. And I'd like to thank all these co-investigators and all the funding agencies who have ensured that um, this work is possible. And without them, we would not have been able to do all the um, work that I've presented here. And um, also, um, just as a side note, this is um, in addition to the work we're doing on the rank pathway, um, we're already beginning to identify using a host of genomic approaches to interrogate um, the associations of other genomic markers with mammographic breast density and with the goal of translating this further into breast cancer prevention. So we just completed a study looking at metabolomic profile of mammographic breast density and translating that to breast cancer. We're also um, beginning to start a series of study looking at proteomic markers of mammographic breast density and taking that further into breast cancer as well. And um, this uh, members of my lab, without which a lot of the work I've presented here would not have been possible. Thank you so much for your attention. I'll be happy to take any questions that you may have. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Toriola, uh, to the conference uh, participants. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A feature uh, located at the bottom of your screen. And uh, while we wait on questions, I wanted to remind everyone that next week we have uh, Christopher Klebanov uh, from the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center who will be presenting on immunogenicity and therapeutic targeting of recurrently mutated public new antigens. Uh, to view all upcoming Winship Ground Round lectures, uh, please visit the Ground Rounds page on the Winship Cancer Center website or the Winship calendar. Uh, while we wait for questions from the audience, uh, Dr. Triola, uh, thank you very much again for showing us uh, the phenomenal work you're doing in this space. Um, the question from my, uh, at least from my view is with the increasing incidence of obesity, uh, do you see some of the changes that you've seen in your study uh, having to do with that increased incidence irrespective of the potential uh, for the use of the chemo preventative measures such as the rank ligand um, inhibitor. And thank you very much. That's a great question. Yes, um, obesity um, we know has been increasing. Um, the prevalence of obesity in the United States now stands at about um, 42%. And we know that obesity increases the risk of postmenopausal breast cancer. Um, unfortunately, well, I don't know, I don't know that to say unfortunately, or, but the association of um, higher body mass index with premenopausal breast cancer has actually been quite fascinating because higher breast, um, higher obesity or higher BMI 
is actually inversely related to premenopausal breast cancer. So um, it's been challenging to tease out and use that in relation to preventing premenopausal breast cancer. But yes, with postmenopausal breast cancer, um, reducing body weight is a really, really um, good approach to prevent and reduce the incidence of premenopause, I mean, of postmenopausal breast cancer. Also maintaining a healthy weight and avoiding sudden weight gain during the postmenopausal period is very, very crucial to reducing um, the risk of postmenopausal breast cancer. So that's very, very crucial. And we should um, include that in our cancer prevention um, messages. Yes, with the rising obesity trends, we do have a lot of work to do in that space to ensure that um, we don't continue to see an impact on increasing postmenopausal breast cancer down the years. Uh, and how do you separate uh, dietary habits, you know, from all these changes? Oh, um, that's a very, very complex um, <laughs> <laughs> That's very complex. We uh, studies have looked at the role of dietary factors in in, in breast cancer incidence, and yes, certain dietary patterns um, have been shown to be very protective of having breast cancer. Um, um, diets high in um, vegetables and fibers, and um, that's been shown by the Pulling Project to reduce the um, incidence and risk of breast cancer by about twelve percent. Um, studies high in um, carbs and um, other um, um, red meat have been shown to increase the risk of um, breast cancer. Um, we tend to employ very sophisticated um, study design methods and also approaches, statistical approaches to tease out the effect of diet from that of obesity, um, ensuring that we can capture their independent effect on breast cancer risk. And we've been able to do that. Um, studies have been able to show that they're independent of each other but also we also need to also need to remember that most of these risk factors do not act in isolation. They all act together um, to increase the risk of breast cancer or other cancer types as well. So there's no one factor that is as singularly important. We should address all the factors together, whether dietary factors, um, obesity related factors, physical activity related factors, density related factors, the most um, the best approach or the most robust approach is to um, address all this peri pursuit so that while addressing one, we don't run the risk of um, leaving the others behind and not addressing them as adequately as needed. Excellent. Um, I don't see any questions in the Q&A chat box. So maybe we can um, close the presentation early. Thank you once again. It's been a pleasure catching up and we look forward to our collaborative efforts in the future. Thank you so much once again, Dr. Alishi, for the invite. It was a pleasure um, presenting my work here. <laughs>